Now, another part of the early church is you've got an organization. The church is an organization. It kind of reminds me of the book of Deuteronomy. Do you remember in Deuteronomy how there was a shift from Moses? And Moses now is realizing he's going to go up on Mount Nebo and he's going to die. And Moses looks out over the promised land. He can't go in. He realizes it. So what he does is Moses in Deuteronomy sets up the basic institutions of Israel. And he tells them, hey, when I'm gone... Moses, the servant of the Lord, is going to die. I'm going to die and stuff. When you're in the promised land, hey, there's going to be prophets. And you know something? The prophets should speak the word of God. God should put his word in their mouth. And if they're false prophets and they say, let's go after other gods, those are false prophets. So he says, but you will have prophets. You'll have prophets like me. You'll have prophets like me. So there'll be a prophetic. He says, you'll have judges. Moses was also involved in judging the people and stuff. And then the 70 after that and stuff. Moses says, you're going to have judges. You make sure that those judges don't take a bribe. And so he sets up prophets, he sets up judges. Uh, he also sets up the Levites and says basically the Levites are going to get the Levitical cities. They're not going to get an inheritance like the uh, rest of the tribes. They're going to be scattered among Israel. The Levites are to teach Israel the Torah, the law, and stuff. And then he goes to the, um, the judges, the prophets. Uh, he's also got uh, the king. And in De- Deuteronomy 17, Moses says, hey, when you get over there, you're going to say, let us have a king like the other nations, okay? If you get a king, it's good for you to have a king. You're going to have a king, okay? David will be a king, but Moses is long after Moses. Moses says, you're going to have a king, but you make sure the king doesn't rip off the people and make wealth for himself on the backs of his people. You make sure that he doesn't multiply wives and develop harems. And you make sure he doesn't develop horses, that he doesn't develop this big military complex, that he trusts the Lord. And so Moses then describes the kingship, the priesthood, the prophecy, and and, uh, the judges, and basically sets up the institutions of Israel because he's going to die, and so he sets up these institutions. In the book of Acts, what you've got is something very similar to that. Acts is now moving from Jesus with his 12 apostles. Jesus with his 12 apostles. It's moving to a church. So now it's moving beyond the apostles, and there needs to be some sort of organization. And so basically what you've got in the book of Acts is a description of this early organization. And I just want to run through, and as we do, I just want you to reflect on some of your own denominational connections and just in how your own denominations do this kind of church organization thing. So, and I want to use this acrostic, acrostic A-D-E-P, uh, to kind of run through this, okay, for the simple organization in the early church. Well, the first group of people were the apostles. Okay, the first group was the apostles, and the apostles in the early church, there, was, there were 12 apostles. Now, I think we've discussed earlier of why there were 12 apostles, and it's interesting. Um, after Judas goes out and hangs himself, kills himself, Judas is gone, they've got 11 apostles. Now you think, well, why don't we just 11 of us go out? No, 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 there had to be 12. There had to be 12. And so there was 12 apostles, and we said there was some coordination. I think in the book of John when we were discussing this, there's some coordination between the 12 apostles and the 12 tribes of Israel. And um, so you get, in the book of Revelation, you get the, the pearly gates in Jerusalem coming down for the 12 tribes of Israel. And the foundations, there's 12 foundations of the new Jerusalem comes down, the 12 foundations of the 12 apostles. So there's this coordination. Jesus said, you apostles will be judging the 12 tribes of Israel. The 12 apostles will be judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So 12 apostles, 12 tribes of Israel. And you realize, you know, there's different ways of numbering the 12 tribes and different ways of looking at the, the 12 apostles. It's very similar. you got Paul coming in and being an apostle. Paul's an apostle of Jesus Christ, too. He becomes an apostle born out of time, kind of in a different, different way and things than the other apostles. Do you remember what were the two requirements for the apostles? That's something interesting. comes up in the book of Acts. There were two requirements. When they went to replace Judas, they said there's two things that we got to expect from these guys. Okay? First of all, he has to have been with Jesus from the beginning. He has to have been with Jesus from the beginning. He's had to see all Jesus' miracles. He's got to learn the teaching of the parables. He's got to have seen the I am the bread of life, the I am the good shepherds, the I am statements and stuff. He's had to have sat under the ministry of Jesus and stuff. So he's better been with, with us from the beginning. Okay, And apparently there were many people that traveled with Jesus, including a group of women that were supporting them and things. And so this guy's had to be from the beginning. That's the first thing. He's been, been with Jesus from the beginning. The second thing is that he had to see the resurrection, that he had to see the re- resurrected Lord. And so what you have here then, those two requirements, 
from the beginning, been with Jesus from the beginning, seen the resurrection, they picked Mattathias, okay, as a twelfth apostle. And um, and now they've got the twelve apostles in place. Okay, so the apostles are sent ones, and it's kind of interesting. The term apostolos means sent one, and it's kind of interesting. Somebody raised this in class about what does apostle mean. Well, ap- apostello means the sent ones, ones that are sent out in ministry and that kind of thing. But it's interesting. In the book of Romans, there's a woman there called Junius. In the book of Romans, and Paul greets this woman Junius, who was, and he labels her as an apostle, one who was sent out. So it's very interesting. She's not one of the twelve. She's not one of the twelve, but she's labeled with this this one having been sent. Uh, she's labeled as an apostle, and she's a woman uh, in the book of Romans, chapter sixteen. So it's an interesting thing. The term apostle replies, applies to these twelve. But then it seems to be those that are sent out would also be called an apostle, but not kind of like not a capital A apostle, but a small a apostle. The same way you would have, uh, oh, well, okay, just the differences there. So, apostles, those are the 12, Acts chapter 1. Deacons, uh, what comes up in chapter 6, okay? In chapter 6 of, of Acts, the church has a, an initial problem. And the problem is they've got Greek widows and they've got Hebrew widows. Remember how Luke always picks up on the widows and the only child thing uh, from the book of Luke. When someone's an only child, Luke picks up on that. When they're a widow, he picks up that this woman is a widow. And so in the book of Acts here, in chapter 6, basically, there were the Grecian widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. They were sharing all things in common. The Greek women were being overlooked. The Hebrew women were not. And so there's this conflict, and you can see it's along kind of cultural, ethnic lines. And so they basically set up the deacons then, the deacons as one to take care of this. So the deacons was a response then to a need in the church. The Greek women should receive just like the Hebrew women do. In order to solve that problem, uh, you know, we're the apostles. We don't want to get involved with all that necessarily. We need people that can take care of. They take care of these women and stuff. And so they make this, the, the deacons, okay? And the deacons, one of the first deacons, they picked seven, I believe it was seven deacons. Stephen was one of the first deacons, okay? Man of integrity to handle the situation. Stephen was one of the first deacons. And so that's in chapter 6. And then in chapter 7, Stephen gives his speech, and that's when he's stoned to death. So it's kind of interesting. In chapter 6, Stephen is given this great uh, responsibility of being a deacon in the church, and then the next chapter, he gives this long speech, and they stone him to death. So Stephen, those two chapters, 6 and 7, about Stephen and the deacons. And uh, many of our churches today will have deacon boards, okay? A um, couple things on that. I grew up uh, initially in a, a very, uh, con- very, very conservative, uh, independent, uh, fundamental uh, Baptist church. And we always had a deacon board. And the deacon board then hired a pastor in, and then basically the deacons run the church and things. And so the deacons, if you're in that kind of a context, some of the context, you have a deacon board and you have a pastor then hired by the deacon board, and the deacon board runs the church. And that's how some of the polity, the polity of how uh, Baptist churches work, Okay, different churches handle it differently and very differently. So it's not, uh, you see that where did the deacons come from? The deacons were initiated based on a need. The church had a need, so they responded with an organization to meet that need. Uh, is it appropriate for, ch- for churches? It, is it appropriate for churches to be involved in soup kitchens, helping the poor? Well, here you see in the Book of Acts, the church, the early church, was involved in helping the poor, the Greek widows, uh, Grecian versus the Hebrew women. So the, there is a very uh, great historical goes back right to the beginning of the church that the church was supplying the physical needs actually taking care of the physical needs of the church. That's one of the great things. Um, Dr. Green here at Gordon College is one of the leading people in the Salvation Army movement. And the Salvation Army does so, so, so well in training people uh, and and training them with job skills and stuff. And then also taking and and, and allowing uh, goods to flow into uh, times of need. Uh, When 9-11 happened, I'll never forget it, 9-11 happened in the Great Towers and in New York City came down. What well, was one of the first groups that was there? 
It was one group that was there saying, hey, give us money, give us money, give us money so we can support them. That wasn't the Salvation Army. The Salvation Army wasn't asking for a dime. They were there and they were distributing you know, a blankets and various things to help people immediately. And when there's great tragedies in the world, who is some of the first people there? It's Salvation Army. And uh, they don't, you know, they aren't the ones always asking to raise billions and billions of dollars, spending millions of dollars on all these administrators to administer uh, this aid, so to speak. And therefore, I, I, I guess I have a super high respect for the Salvation Army and the work that they do. It's, it's tremendous. And basically, does it fit in with Scripture? Sure does. Acts chapter 6, the deacons and the whole thing there with the distribution of, of need of food for the uh, the widows and things. So anyways, the deacons. So the deacons was a, a role. Now here's another set of uh, things, and this is, gets a little bit complicated. This is in the uh, course on church polity, church structure, organizational structure. But it's interesting, the elders... I'm going to give you the Greek terms, not because I want you to learn Greek. I do want you to learn Greek, but just uh, check this out. The elders are called, listen to this word, presbyteroi. Presbyteroi. The elders are presbyteroi. Uh, guess what church features elders as an elder board in a church as opposed to a deacon board? Who does the elders? Presbyteroi. Okay. Can you catch the connection between Presbyterian? Presbyterian churches have a board of elders. And so this is basically comes from this word presbyteros, okay, which are translated elders. Um, now here's another word that's used almost interchangeably, okay? These are synonyms. There's going to be, whenever you have synonyms, there's going to be areas of commonness, areas of difference. But this, the second word is called overseers. And as presbyteroi were translated for elders, these overseers are translated episkopos. Episcopos, what does that sound like? Episcopos, sounds like Episcopalian, right? The Episcopos and Episcopalian, okay? These overseers, okay? And so, like we said, that the, these terms seem to be used somewhat interchangeably, so I don't make a big distinction between these overseers or these Episcopos and the, uh, and the elders, the Presbyteroi. And then, similarly, the term pastor, the term pastor, actually comes from the Greek uh, poimen, poimen uh, meaning shepherd, shepherd, kind of having a root rooted back in this notion of shepherd. As a shepherd takes care of his sheep, so a pastor takes care of his people. And so this, the pastor should have a real heart for his people, even as a shepherd has a heart for his sheep. And so the term pastor fits in here. A lot of churches will have a board of elders, and the chief elder then, you'll have a board of elders, and then you'll have a chief elder or a teaching elder, a, a teaching elder. And sometimes there'll be parity among the elders, they'll be, all be the same, but this one will have a special function that he's considered the teaching elder. And the other elders will have different functions in the church. But the teaching elder then will be labeled as a pastor and things like that, some churches. And the, the, some churches have the teaching elder is above the deacon board, some of them it would be more that they're all the same, but he has the special gift of teaching. Um, and those types of things. So different structures, and, and again, I think the New Testament is not saying you got to do it exactly like this. We see that the structure of the church came out of the needs of the church. And when you got a church of some of these churches today, you got a church of say a thousand, two thousand people. Are you going to have to have a different structure for two thousand people than you are? You come to New England and you got a church of twenty-five people, or you got a house church of a matter of ten people in a house church. Well, is that going to have a different structure to it than, a, say, a church of 2,000? Of course it's going to. And so you really adapt the structure based on the need. And that was the point in Acts chapter 6. You've got, you've got a need, you develop, develop a structure to meet that need. And so I think there's a great amount of flexibility built into the uh, polity of the church. And that's just, again, my personal opinion. Different churches, Baptists, will work differently in terms of how they structure it. But even within the Baptists, the different churches, and depending on the size of the churches, they'll handle it differently. Presbyterian, as we said, you know, there, are they all equal elders, or is there teaching elders above, or the same thing? And Episcopos, the Episcopalians will handle that differently as well. So each, even within each group, there should be variation depending on size and needs of the church. And there's allowed to be flexibility in that and uh, things. But you see that early uh, description of these uh, things there as well. Now, one that we, we need to talk about a little bit here is the notion of prophets and prophetesses. 
There were prophets in the early church, uh, prophetess, uh, prophets. Probably the most famous one you're going to see in the book of Acts is this guy Agabus. And Agabus is almost like an Elijah figure. He, he prophesies about a famine kind of coming in the land, kind of similar to Elijah did. Uh, Agabus also, when Paul comes into uh, Palestine with all this money to remember to support the poor, on the third missionary journey, Paul's collecting money so that when he comes back to Jerusalem, he's going to help. There's a famine in, in Palestine. He's going to help the poor people in Jerusalem. And Agabus, the prophet, goes up and binds Paul, or binds uh, with this uh, part of his garment or something, and uh, basically binds him and says, whoever does wears this thing, you go up to Jerusalem, they're going to they're gonna imprison you up there. You're going to have big problems. You're going to be thrown in jail up there. And so Agabus warns Paul ahead of time, and so this prophet told Paul what was coming down the road for him, and sure enough, Paul says, well, i got to go up there. Paul goes up there, and sure enough, he's thrown in prison. So you have uh, Agabus as a prophet. You also have Philip's prophesying daughters. Ag and then Acts chapter uh, 21, verse 8 yeah, let me just uh, read this, Acts chapter 21, verse 8. Leaving the next day, we reached Caesarea and stayed at the house of Philip the Evangelist, one of the seven. So Philip the Evangelist was one of the seven, which means he's one of the deacons, okay, the original, the original deacons. Okay, he had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. I'm sorry, I think I've been saying five, but it should have been four. Four unmarried daughters, unmarried, who prophesied. So here we have uh, kind of like a Hulda or like a Deborah. And even Mary, um, Mary, do you remember the great Magnificat that Mary gave in Acts, in, in the book of Luke, where Mary gives this magnificat, my soul magnifies the Lord, and Mary praises God and gives scripture. And it's actually recorded in our scripture, kind of like Miriam. That's maybe the best example. Miriam, back in Ac um, Exodus chapter 15, when they crossed over the Red Sea or the Reed Sea, when they get across the Red Sea, Miriam turns around and gives this song. And Miriam also in Numbers chapter 12, she's Moses' older sister, but she's considered, um, God says, hey, uh, when a prophet, I speak to prophets in dreams and visions, but Moses I speak with face to face. And, and Miriam gets rebuked at that point, but Miriam seems to have been a prophetess. Uh, she gives forth scripture. She makes a song and sings songs and stuff. So these... Um, this structure then, so you do have prophets and prophetesses. Now, this, this raises a big question, and I'm not sure, to be honest with you, I can solve all these things, but just some ways, frameworks, and maybe a thinking about it. You have different levels of prophets and things. Uh, is it saying that these prophets and prophetesses, that they're the ones that are going to write the New Testament? Well, no, that's not really true. Matthew writes the New Testament, Mark writes the New Testament, Luke writes the New Testament, and I don't know that any of Matthew, Mark, or Luke are called prophets.